call the uh, the meeting to order. Um, we'll do a quick roll call. Dr. Turetsky. Here. Perfect. And Dr. Kawaguchi. Here. And Dr. Wong, I'm present, so we have a quorum. Number two on the agenda is public comment. That's not on the agenda. So I'll open it up to public comment, see if anyone wants to add any matters to the agenda for a future meeting. Madam. This is the moderator and I have opened the Q&A panel for public comment. If you would like to make a public comment, please click on the Q&A icon located at the bottom of your screen and type you would like to make a public comment and send to all panelists. I will take all comments in the order they are received. You will be given two minutes with a 10 second warning. I will pause a moment to allow individuals time to access this feature. It does not appear we've received any comments. Madam Chair, would you like me to close this feature? Yes, please. Feature has been closed. Okay, then we will move on to item three, discussion and possible action for minutes of the January 31st meeting. And are, does anyone have any comments? Lennar Dave? Nope. All right, then can I get a motion to pass the minutes? I will motion to accept the minutes as they've been presented. I second that. Perfect. And I will just uh, vote on them. Dr. Turetsky. Aye. Dr. Kawaguchi. Aye. Dr. Wong, aye. Motion passes. And now we are on item four, discussion and possible action presented by Adam Bentley, Chair of the DOC. Mr. Bentley. Hello, everyone. Um, so apologies ahead of time. I'm a little under the weather, but I will power through this. Uh, so um, first, I just wanted to like first take a minute and uh, thank everyone, uh, specifically the board and uh, Dr. Kawaguchi and also the public comments that were left on uh, the statutes that were given to the DOC and just to reassure the DOC took you know the time to uh, comment and talk seriously through each of the um, suggestions. And then, um, so what I hope to present today is definitely a more comprehensive review of the DOC discussion. Um, so there will be a lot more, hopefully more clarity to the decisions made. So what I've done is um, I worked with staff to review the minutes from our DOC meeting, just so that I can consolidate our uh, discussion and the decisions that we made on each of the statute reviews. So first, what I would like to discuss uh, with the group is what I'll do is I'll run through um, a, a couple of the, let's say some of the lighter topics um, that didn't, uh, I don't think will involve too, too much. Um, Let's see, so I wanted to start with, so if we look at this um, statute 2550.1 C and D, uh, we had a comment from the NAOO and it says that the uh, definition does not make sense as written, um, suggests that certain acts will be listed, but no such acts were listed. Uh, and the board both agreed just to place the semicolon. So I uh, felt like that was um, decided on by the board and that would be something that we could move on uh, with a, a 2.50.1 C and D. And then Also, uh, right below that, we had a uh, comment from the NAOO as well that was suggesting removal of the terms registered optician, registered dispensing optician, that they're confusing, and recommends that the terms be removed from the statute um, and replaced with the definitions from subsect one through four. So the DOC, as we reviewed it, we declined uh, to make a change because what it did was it was able to list 
the um, like RDO versus RSLD. So really defining the business registration from the individual registration for opticians as well as the contact lens um, registration as well. So uh, we felt that as it was written, it made it provided clarity because there are a lot of titles under the optician blanket. Um, but uh, we felt that it was necessary to have each of those titles. Make yeah. Uh, and then let's. See. Um, And then one comment I wanted to go through was uh, Dr. Kawaguchi, um, looking at sub, uh, looking at 2550.1G, um, Dr. Kawaguchi had uh, commented for us that the, um, he didn't feel like the subsections three and four as, are as needed as it makes the statute a little bit more confusing. And I think what was unique is that with, um, as we discussed on the DOC is that three and four provided the needed clarity for RDOs when directing staff um, that are not certified or registered. What can they do within the state of California? Um, and I know that uh, it might, because I think that's specific to opticians. And as we look at optician specific statutes, it was uh, helpful for us to really direct what staff can and cannot do. So if you're an unregistered person um, or uncertified person, then uh, what are you able to do within the business? And I think that really helps because there are other states that have very clear guidelines to say this person can do this or this person cannot do this. And also we're looking at like the acts that we're regulating. So within an RDO business, we regulate certain acts. So it's really defining those acts. So Glenn, do you, do you agree with, because this is, um, you're saying that this section is not, that you didn't feel that we needed this section? Well, I, I think it's regulation for the sake of regulation. And the reason I say that is if we think about um, medicine and optometry, um, doctors are able to delegate tasks as they've trained and have confidence in staff. And so to be so specific with opticians, I don't know that it's necessary. I think that we would look at it the same way that we look at the healthcare field, which is if there is a registered SLD that is overseeing um, unregistered staff, that it's gonna vary what they will delegate to that individual based on the training that they've received from that person and their oversight. So I I understand the intent. I'm just um, not sure that it's a necessary thing uh, based on looking at other standards in other professions. But this is this Adam. This is based on what's written in other states. Is that correct? Or um, yeah, I'd say like one great example is like I think Nevada does a very clear explanation of like within like what within like an RDO within like our business of a registered business um, what what acts clearly can be done and what cannot be done because within opticianry like we, we are regulating certain specific acts. So, I mean, what's listed is basically everything that they would be able to do under if they were a registered optician. Also, it's just it's under the supervision of a RDO. Yes. So, so I would have a legal question around it. This, I guess, is for Rebecca. So, with this proposed change, it feels to me like we're trying to regulate people that are not 
registered. And, so, and we don't have any power of enforcement if an unregistered individual is going beyond those bounds. We still wouldn't have any ability to quote unquote go after them. Isn't that correct? So I'm in your materials on page 10 of the packet. Could you zero me in on which statute you're referring to at the, in this part of the discussion? It's on uh, page 24, I mean, sorry, page 20 of the packet. Oh. And, uh, G. So the actual. Oh, I see. You're into the actual text. Okay. And then sub G. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. So you're talking about unregistered trainees. Um, okay. And your concern is that you're trying to regulate things that uh, that, uh, that an unlicensed person is doing. Let's see. Individual is not registered with the board. Or is this, uh, is this more just telling the registered RDO, this is what you're allowed to have your, those that you are supervising do? Um, say that last part again. So my question yeah. is, but this, we can't, I mean, obviously we can't regulate the unregistered optician trainees. So this is also in a way to tell all the RDOs, this is what your trainees. Able to supervise. Yeah. I think it, it appears to me that you could flip it and say, you know, the dispensing, the registered dispensing optician uh, may supervise someone who does X, Y, Z. And that's one way to, to maybe do that. Um, let's see, individual not registered with the board. Uh, three and adjusting. And so specifically um, three and four, um, I'm noticing the comment that says that, uh, okay, that's more related to being, okay. Uh, yeah, like I said, if you, if you prefer to flip it and make it about the registered dispensing optician specifically, I think that's all right. You know, it's, it's, um, it's a kind of an odd thing to approach because it's statutory, right? If the legislature decides they want to do this, they they have the power to do it if um you know it's in other words it's a very different context than talking about regulations and what we have the authority to do um if you're if you're trying to carve out and say that unregistered folks are still able to do this that and the other i don't see a problem with um uh sort of outlining what's what what you're saying is okay even without the uh the dispensing optician um title well, my, my worry is uh, additionally that I could think of at least one scenario where things can get very gray because let's say that there is an ophthalmologist that has employed uh, a registered spectacle lens dispenser and there are also employees that are unregistered mm -hmm. and the ophthalmologist has assigned for the SLD to be a manager and oversee the rest of the staff. However, the ophthalmologist decides that he or she wants the unregistered to be doing things additional to this list that we have. We have to go to then, then who, who, would that, who would that fall on? Um, it, it gets confused. It looks it sounds confusing to me that we're saying that if an SLD has these unregistered people, but they're going to be held responsible for something that maybe they're not getting to decide on. Okay, that last part that 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 who is getting uh, deciding who's responsible that we're not getting to decide on. Sorry, say that last part again. So the we're saying that it's going to be the SLD who is responsible in this in this suggestion instead of a statute. Uh, it would be the SLD that's responsible for overseeing the unregistered staff member. However, mm -hmm. in some office settings, if it's a doctor who is then overriding that and telling unregistered staff to do additional things, um, yet the SLD is the manager of staff, it just kind of creates, I think, a gray area of who, who do we hold accountable 
if there is uh, a breach of professionalism or conduct and you know if if for example if a unregistered person um, is being claimed to have done some things without direction we don't have the power to go after the person who's unregistered uh, and then the registered SLD could just say, I never directed them to do those things. Okay. I just feel like it sets us up for some too much vagueness. Okay. So I think, uh, let's see, a couple of things. I think um, you're, you're, I see what you're saying about who ultimately can kind of be. Um, as you be. <laughs> what, one, one moment. One moment. Hey, Glenn, with the provision that's right under that, where it says that anybody that's working under the supervision of a, an ophthalmologist or an optometrist, it, none, of the, none of these regulations apply to them. So would that, don't you think that would mitigate the whole circumstance if the ophthalmologist said, hey, I'm, I'm giving everything over to my SLD? What's the section, Dave? <laughs> This is Natalia. Right under the rest of G, there is a provision that says this, the provisions of this chapter should not apply to any an individual in any setting that where optometry or ophthalmology is practiced who is acting under the direct super responsibility and supervision of a physician and surgeon or optometrist. So I think that would assuage your uh, fears about that, Dr. Kawaguchi. It does and it doesn't. And the reason that it doesn't is because that's saying then that the doctor is the direct supervisor, but I know that in many offices, the doctor is not the direct manager of unregistered staff. But if, but if the doctor is asking the staff to do stuff that's outside the purview of an RDO, like working at patients or something, then that comes directly under the doctor's responsibility. So I think this part right here, section G, is referring to optician trainees that are doing Registered dispensing, registered dispensing optician work without being licensed for it. Anything else that's outside of what an RDO would normally do, and then if they're in a doctor's office, would then fall under the purview of the of the doctor. Okay, so I'm good with that. So I have. I want, I want also, to, I just wanted to add, and, and maybe Sheree, you can piggyback or, or jump in here, that that type of situation, though, Dr. Kawaguchi, I think would certainly be an issue. And if a consumer were aware of that, or if the SLD or CLD felt that they were put in a position where they were being asked to directly supervise, that certainly are details that we would investigate in an enforcement case in order to meet out what was the line of supervision, who was here, and were they able to give the authority to do the actions reported, were they in fact able to supervise such activities? So I think that that our including this gives us, uh, uh, gives licensees and particularly those registered dispensing optician businesses who don't include doctors, right? Because they cannot be employed by, a, a doctor cannot be employed by an RDO uh, business. Um, but it gives them a clear, such a clear indication of what a trainee can do when, in fact, they are the full line of supervision. So I think that that the text under G, um, the provision of this chapter does not apply, gives us the gives the industry the opportunity to employ within offices professionals of all different levels. But when we come down to the enforcement of an actual or investigation of an actual enforcement issue or a, a consumer protection claim, then we will come into uh, you know taking interviews to understand what the line of supervision was in order to understand whether or not there was an issue that this SLD or CLD was put in a position to oversee duties that wouldn't be appropriate. Okay, a second uh, point. So I, I'm fine with that. So before you even said all that, I was fine with that. I looked at over what Dave was talking about, so I'm fine with that. But um, a second thing that I'm, it's not a specific concern, it's more of a broad concern, and that is um, as we look to make changes, one of, I think, our important goals is to create new laws and regulations that hopefully can stand the test of time. And the more specific we are about specific tasks, that 
exist now, but don't include potential tasks in opticianry that may happen in the future, it would mean that it may force us to have to relook at the laws and regulations again in the future every single time something new comes out, or potentially not consider it allowable under an SLD's supervision. So again, it just kind of goes back to my overarching desire of adding things if it's not necessary to add them. Can is it too vague if we were to include an additional statement or somewhere in there where we talk about and all other not skills, but all other skills that an RDO is licensed to do to kind of cover any future um, extension of, of practice privileges by an optician? I can give a good example if this helps is the, um, the like the term dispense because uh, there is like a, in other states they'll say that the act of dispensing is regulated um, but it's really understanding like the, the, because it, it is a broader word but it's like what exactly are we talking about are we talking about physically transferring the optical device to the customer or is it dispensing as in you know, putting them on the customer fit, you know, doing the final adjustments. What is dispensing? And so I think that this is where we were trying to get in here is a little bit more clarity so that there isn't, it's not as great as just saying like dispensing. I think also too, we've got to be careful about trying to future proof, right? We um, in developing the CE recommend or CE uh, regulation or reg package, right? We had a desire to want to make sure that we could incorporate new technologies that we don't see emerging. And that's just really different, difficult for a regulatory body. But I think that, you know, the discussion here indicates that there's a need to give more specificity. And it is our continued job to review statutes and review the industry in order to make adjustments that go along with practice and give consumers protection uh, against new technologies or new um, sorts of duties. So I, I think that there's just, you know, I, I want to, who was it yesterday? The enemy of the perfect being the enemy of the good. Um, <laughs> that, that, that there is a need here and that we can address this need. And then it, of course, continues to be our charge to look into whether or not the duties of the optician is changing. I'm, I'll just throw in my two cents. I think I think Lillian's point is really well taken. And things are going to change drastically in the next five years. And I could see opticians taking on far greater responsibilities and using using new instrumentation and equipment that comes out. Um, I don't think we should be as be real, real specific. I think we should leave some room for growth and development that isn't going to end up having to go back to the legislature to be uh, to be modified. So I, I would agree that that the least specific we could make this, the better. Well, I mean, we could. I mean, since the DOC feels that these being this specific right here is helping opticians, I think keeping this would be fine. But I guess my question, I don't know if it would be to staff or to Rebecca, is is there a way that we can put just like an additional statement saying for and and any future expansion of op, 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 opticianary privileges or skills or scope that the RDO could then could then also um, supervise. So expanded opticianary scope skills. Because if, if if the DOC thinks that they need this kind of specific this kind of detail, then I mean they're they're the ones who are directly supervising. So this is not, it's all laid up. I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about future, and I know we can't, but we can just be a, trying to do a slightly vague statement, I guess, to, to okay, cover ahead, so what, we, what we know might be coming in the next five to ten years. But I don't know how to write that. I think more than necessarily saying that specifically, um, I want to highlight the last, you know, the last three of you commenting about 
that sort of echelon of statutes versus the power you guys will have in a regulatory capacity later. So all, all the last three of you were, were, were talking about that, this idea of you can't totally predict the future and the more maneuverability you have in the statutes, the better, because then you'll, you'll have a lot more ability in uh, your regulatory capacity to deal with the nuances, because that's the whole idea, right? You're interpreting and you're making specific in your regs. So I don't think you would necessarily need to include a phrase like that, um, but I think uh, this idea of keeping it somewhat broad and capturing um, your general intent and your general um, uh, expertise you know, as a board, your ability to say what it what these delineations you want are, you know, who's who's who do you want to be responsible for this kind of supervision? Who do you want responsible for that? And what are the things that you're okay with someone who's unregistered but is supervised doing? And then you guys can take it from there and have a lot more uh, room to run with it in regs, I think. So I, I think I want to ask Adam, right, moving back to that professional expertise of do you feel that this is too prescriptive? Is this too specific? Uh, and then also remembering that we've got uh, that this is certainly going to change because we've got three occupational analyses that are coming to bear in the next year where we really will be looking at what's going on in the industry and how folks are, are, are interacting within vision care. What, what is your sort of thought about whether or not this this is too specific for us? And I love embracing change. <laughs> so I know it's happened. It's going to happen. Um, and I think I think, yeah, for, for me and my and when I'm in an RDO business, it's it's good to know that we're regulating specific acts and saying that certain individuals perform specific acts. And then if you're not a registered individual, here's what you can do. Um, if it's just if if we want to be a little bit more broad and just say that because who knows what the again who knows what the future holds uh, so could we could we say something that all unregistered optician trainees can be supervised in all skills that are allowed to an RDO? And then in the RDO section list, then it would be a referral. Back so this is, this is Natalia. So it, it, it almost already says that fitting and adjusting of spectacle lens is under the direct responsibility of the supervising spectacle lens dispenser is what it says right now. Uh, the only exceptions would be three and four, which Dr. Kawaguchi put up, which pertains specifically to the sales and the um, customer service side of opticianry. Uh, so right now, as it says, is and it refers back to the section. So leaving it as is, if the sections that are referring to are changed, it will apply to this section. Okay. Madam Chair, might I, I want to recognize the fact that two of our dispensing petition committee members have taken extra time within their schedules to listen to today's proceedings and to provide comment if needed. Um, within the uh, uh, attendees, we have uh, Bill Casella and we have uh, registered SLD, CLD, Anna Watts. Might it be um, uh, beneficial at this time to say take public comment. Uh, perhaps Anna, who directly supervises un, uh, unlicensed trainees, might have a, a little insight for us as well. I think that would be a great idea. So, um, Madam Moderator, if we could ask for a public comment at this time. This is the moderator, being that they were called out specifically. I have went ahead and promoted them to panelists so that way they can unmute their mics first. And once they have um, made any comments that they have, I will go ahead and open the Q&A feature. That way I can just manage it a little bit easier. Right. Before we move forward, I just want to make sure that that's appropriate. Um, of course, the DOC committee members are not members of the board. They are members of the committee. Um, but we would then at that point have uh, a quorum of the committee participating in this. That she's comfortable with that proceeding as we've indicated. Yes, thanks for checking on numbers and all that. They're, they're fine to contribute on, on the subject matter of the committee. Thanks.
So this is the moderator. Um, Bill and Anna, you have the ability to unmute your microphone and add any comments that you have related to this discussion. Hi, uh, this is uh, Bill Casella. Can you guys hear me? We can. Okay. So in, in listening, um, uh, hello everybody, it's good to see you all. Um, in listening to, to the discussion, part of the issue is we're dealing here with kind of a substantive provision in a definition section, right? Because what we're really saying is that in the practice, the, um, the SLD uh, uh, can supervise uh, these people doing these things. But uh, to Glenn's point, it's like, yeah, they're the only person who we have jurisdiction over. So, um, and then I liked, I think Natalia raised the point at the end, which may clean everything up, is the, the substantive work under one and two under this definition is pursuant to the um, the other sections, 2559.15 and uh, 2560. So um, as times change, um, uh, that work will change. Uh, and the cross-reference, I think, captures that. My comment is maybe we clean it up by saying, uh, and this, um, uh, this might defeat with, with the purpose we originally kind of listed this for that Adam mentioned you know, of saying this is what these assistants can do. Um, maybe say that if the definition of an unregistered optician training um, uh, means an individual who's not registered that first sentence uh, pursuant to this chapter, who is performing work under the supervision of a SLD or whoever it is. Then we don't, we don't get into the specifics of the work, but it's clear that these are the people working, working under them. And that might, I don't know if that's too broad, because um, technically that would make the receptionist a unregistered optician trainee. Um, but it might it might um, alleviate the concern about listing specific duties. That's all. Uh, this is Glenn. Um, I I I would be more comfortable with that. I think that that makes more sense than as it's written right now. Um, so that those combined suggestions, I think, would read much better and accomplish potentially the things that we want to be clear and broad at the same time. Bill, Adam, does that does 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 it go against the this this principle that we wanted to say? Hey, the, this is the sort of work that the that the trainees can do, and enumerating that in one and two. Well, no, whole, and, whole and like, I, I appreciate everyone's comments because I think now that now that we've all discussed it. It does seem like a lot and that it could be simplified in a way that is like, you know, it's, it, I think it gives it that broad um, term that we're looking for. I don't think it, I don't think it goes against anything that we were trying to get at, um, because obviously we're just trying to make sure that we have regulated acts. We're making sure those regulated acts are clear. Um, but I think under the purview of an RD or an RSLD, um, yeah, I mean, I think as we stated, it makes sense, but I don't think it goes against anything that we we're trying to get at. And um, I don't know if Anna has a thought on it. Hi, 
Um, no, I definitely agree with what you both have said. Um, I think when we originally discussed it, we wanted things to be more specific just because there was so much confusion. But um, I think, you know, that's a good compromise. This is Shara. So that I, what I'm hearing is that the committee is comfortable with the references to section 2559.15 and the reference to section 2560 that refers back to the statutes that develop the practice act for a registered dispensing optician or, or I'm sorry, a registered contact lens dispenser or a registered spectacle lens dispenser. Is that right? They're, we're comfortable with the references. And I think Bill had also made a comment is that the very first part, unregistered optician trainee means an individual who's not registered with the board pursuant to this chapter and can practice under the direct supervision of a registered SL optician. Excellent. I think so. Okay. Shall I continue? Yes, please. Okay. The next one, I think, um, hopefully, it should be pretty easy. It was a 255U, and this was um, stating that, uh, so we changed the, um, the proposed section to say that it's unprofessional conduct for uh, a registered spectacle lens or um, like an SLD to fill uh, an expired prescription, that if you were to fill up expired prescription, you shouldn't do that. You should refer him back to the doctor. Can you give us a number again? Yes, yeah, sorry about that. 255U. It's on page 26 of the pack. Oh, so I think the comment that someone had made at the last meeting was that if there is a referral by the RDO, that they would then need to enter it for legal reasons so that they couldn't just tell the patient that they would have to write it down somewhere or something. There was some comment about that at the last meeting. Okay, so let me make a comment on that. Um, so I'm gonna connect back to some data that we received about enforcement. So I'm gonna hold it up. Hopefully you can focus on it. So you see that little section of the pie here that's black? You guys see that? Yeah. That is the unprofessional conduct um, and the number of cases for Q4 is one. So this is adding a new regulation, and I feel like this, this is more the responsibility of an optometrist or ophthalmologist. And while an optician um, may choose, and from a professional standpoint, it might be well received by a patient's doctors to suggest to a patient with an expired prescription that maybe you should consider getting a new exam, I don't know that it's appropriate to hold them accountable to that and then to also have to increase documentation for, for uh, registered CLDs or SLDs. Um, I understand the point. I mean, I like the point, and we have that going on with my staff, but Again, I don't want to overregulate um, SLD and CLDs. One of the things that, um, so in the DOC meeting, we had some presentations by those that are educating uh, people that are interested in the industry. 
And it was alarming to me, and I know to probably all of you, of the low number of people out there, the public, that want to become ABO certified in an SLD or CLD. And um, my general premise is we don't want to create too many regulations that um, create too many work processes for those that are considering the profession. Um, again, I think that it's commendable that this was suggested by the DOC. Um, and again, I agree with it in concept, but I don't agree with it to have in a regulation. And I have a quick follow up um, and Natalia might be able to help me, but I believe before this, there was something stating that it was, because um, I remember we talked about it with the DOC that if an optician were to notice anything wrong, like to say like, oh, there's a potential issue with the eyes that they would have to refer them back to the doctor, but we settled on expired prescription. Um, I don't know if Natalia or Shara could clarify, but I think that was the conversation because we wanted to say like, well, it's not really our scope to say like to identify a disease of the eye and refer. So we settled on um, an expired prescription. Um, this is Natalia. Yes, Adam's correct. This is a new statute. It's modifying an old one, but we felt did not apply to the profession. Uh, so we made this change because we felt it applied to opticians more specifically than it looks like you have the tear in the back of your eye. You should probably get the checked. When an optician wouldn't know the tear there to begin with, but they look at the prescriptions on. So, though, if I remember this discussion correctly, DOC determined that this was within their scope um, and applied to them more than the previous statute that was in its place. This is Dave. I don't have it in front of me. I'm looking for it, but the previous statute did say something that if it was if you were filling a pres an expired prescription and it was an emergency situation, um, whatever an emergency was considered, that was acceptable. But you were supposed to, the optician was supposed to advise the patient to return to their ophthalmologist or optometrist for an examination. Um, is this modifying that specific statute, or it, 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 did I miss something? That, does anybody know offhand what's what uh, what um, number I'm talking about in in the, in the current regulations, the current statute? I am attempting to locate it right now. Hang on. I'm still looking for it. If you would like to have further discussion while I search for it, um, I will let you know when I have found it. So um, do we just want to move on to the next section then and come back to this while Natalia's searching for us? I think that would be best, Madam Chair. I do want to um, remind folks that we have a 15 minute backstop um, as we will need to begin the practice and education committee at promptly at 11. Um, we do also have um, some folks who are waiting to give public comment. Um, so perhaps um, we I should just sort of um, I, I found it. It's 2541.1, section E. 2541.1, section E. Uh, 
basically says if a patient's spectacles are lost, broken, or damaged to a degree that renders them unusable, um, upon dispensing a prescription, this is with an expired prescription, upon dispensing a prescription pursuant to the subdivision, the person dispensing shall recommend the patient return to the optometrist or physician and surgeon who issued the prescription for an eye examination and provide the prescriber with written notification of the prescription that was filled. So the optician can fill an expired prescription, tell the patient that he or she should return for an examination, and then the optician has to send a written notice to the optometrist or ophthalmologist that they filled an expired prescription. I'm sure that's done on a regular basis. <laughs> If I can comment, I would say if, if that exists, I would say we would not need you. I agree. <laughs> so the copy I have goes directly from 2554 to 2555. So I don't have any subsections right now. I don't know if you guys removed that. I'm I'm looking in the I'm looking in the law book. Okay. So. Yeah, Lillian, the, the the draft that we have for the meeting is a, a working draft. Yeah. Okay. Well, then I agree. I concur. I think that if that's already written, then you seems superfluous. Natalia, did you find what I'm talking about? I did. I don't think it's the same statute I was referring to, but I agree with um, both you and Dr. Wong that with what you did find that you is superfluous. So in the interest of time, where do we go then uh, now that we have a consensus on you. Dara, can we direct staff to remove you if what they found is still in statute? Yes, of course. And this will be, remember that today's uh, determinations are recommendations to the board. So there will be future uh, discussion um, I also, too, I want to make sure I, this is, is all, you know, it all gets very confusing in that we're working with an existing statute, but we're trying to pull ex existing statutes, um, but trying to pull together a comprehensive practice act that didn't exist before. So I want to make sure that in before we remove you that we aren't trying to give clarity within the practice act for um, a spectacle lens dispenser that currently did not appear and was just in general terms within prescription lens uh, 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 statutes. So part of what I want to remind everyone too, that really the importance of the statute changes that we're looking, that we're proposing now is to provide a comprehensive practice act that gives clear direction and clear definitions so that we can in the future, as we said, have a cohesive and coherent discussion where we're all on the same page about the occupational analyses and what those do to inform a larger change of statutes. So yes, you can certainly instruct staff to uh, remove you. I do just wanna make sure that, that the inclusion of you was not the intention of creating a practice act that is clear for the individual registrant. Uh, Dave, uh, it's, it's Dave again. Uh, with what you just said, Shara, I, I would like somebody to look this over before we move ahead and say you is not necessary because this might, I, I'm not really sure, this might <laughs> pertain to optometrists filling an expired prescription from another optometrist or an ophthalmologist. So I, I, I it, 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 it's somewhat vague because opticianry was under the medical board at the time this was written. So I'm not really sure if this needs, if this actually covers it. 
I, I agree with you. And I'll, I'll... We can take a look in more detail and double check whether that's referring to what we think it's referring to and whether it's necessary. Great. So, so, so Lillian, I have. Wait, Glenn, you're muted. So sorry. Um, so I have a process question for you. So, um, you know, I definitely appreciate the time of the DOP attending and offering additional clarity and discussion. Um, we're not going to be able to finish, right? So what's what's your intent of how we're going to continue to move forward so that we can get to a point where we have something to present to the board at whole? So maybe for the next two big sections, we could just have Adam describe uh, present the, the changes and then at least give us the DOC's reasoning for the, the next two sections that have um, that have had significant comments from the last meeting. Would that be sure do we, do we have enough time? I mean, I know that the PEC meeting is at 1130 and not at 11. So um, we have a little bit of time. You are correct. I apologize. <laughs> uh, yes, at 11.30 rather than 10 and 11.30 are start times. That is true. I think that that would be then a good use of time. We would have time to do that, to go over those last two uh, more debated provisions and then to take comment. Um, as far as procedure, we could certainly look to um, agendize this again for an LRC committee meeting so we can continue to move through these. Uh, I think that that um, making sure that we have a thorough legal review, um, which has not occurred to this point um, from council would be, I think, advisable as well before we move this forward to the board. So we certainly could bring this back to another LRC meeting after council has had sufficient time to review and we even acted those things that have been discussed out today. And, and Lillian, one more thing. Um, when we opened up for public comment so that some of our DOC members could participate, we didn't open up to the rest of the public. Okay, uh, so, you know, so Madam Moderator, could we right now open up to the public for comments up to our current discussions? And then after that, we can have Adam present the next two big sections that are, that currently have a lot of comments. On. This is the moderator and at the direction of the committee, I have opened the Q&A panel. If you would like to make a public comment, please submit. I would like to make a public comment and send to all panelists. I will take requests in the order they are received. With that, we do have a public comment request from a Megan Lopper. Your microphone has been unmuted. Thank you very much and appreciate the discussion today. Megan Loper uh, representing Luxottica. And I think um, Ms. Murphy may have started to answer some of my questions. Uh, in following along, I understand that there are some additional occupational analyses that are expected. And I think what I'm trying to understand is the timing of how those will play into this discussion or if that is a separate item. Um, you know, it, it seems like the, that information may inform the debate, and um, and so I was just curious if, if, from a time perspective, if those are going to be part of the discussion prior to recommending the legislature consider changes to the statute, or if that's a separate effort. Our sure. next public. Oh, sorry. Were you going to respond before I move on? Uh, no. Go ahead. Oh. I'm sorry. That's okay. Our next public comment comes from an individual identified as Joe Neville. Your microphone has been unmuted. Thank you very much. And uh, hello to all the committee members. Joe Neville with the National Association of Optometrists and Opticians. Um, very, very quickly. Two comments regarding 2550.1G, three and four, uh, which which you discussed some, about some of the different functions. Um, just to watch out, if you are going to try to limit the number of people that an SLD can supervise, uh, of the three to one ratio that you've been talking about, then I think you need to understand that you may be creating a third category 
of individual in an optical dispensary. And that's simply, I'll just call it a clerical person. The items in three and four, four as far as I can tell, are not regulated activities. Uh, and so it's not clear to us why you would include those in there. And I know you're gonna do some follow-up on that, but wanted to point that out. And then with 2555U, um, I'll just repeat what we've said in our letter. I think uh, U, as it's written right now, creates a uh, plaintiff's dream. In other words, opticians are going to be subject to claims that if they did not make the statement that you should go see your OD, which I think they do on a regular basis, um, and they do not record and keep a record of that, um, they're going to be subject to lawsuits, not, not just prosecution from the board, but lawsuits. And I think you're putting opticians in an un untenable position if you go forward with that. Um, perhaps a stronger statement about an optician is not permitted to fill an expired prescription might be the better solution. I don't think 2541.1, I think that's uh, what Dr. Turetsky referred to, addresses that. Um, so there may be a better solution uh, rather than creating this legal risk to opticians. Thank you. Our, our next public comment comes from an individual identified as Bill Crisella. Your microphone is unmuted. Hi. Um, so I, I think uh, for you, for 2555U, um, we can combine the last comment with the provision Dr. Turetsky read. And so the unprofessional conduct or whatever this falls under the, yes, the unprofessional conduct for you should be filling an expired prescription, period. And then after that sentence, say it shall not be unprofessional conduct to fill an unpres un to f to fill an expired prescription um in an emergency situation where the pres the prescribing doctor is notified or where the referral happens and prescribing doctor is notified. Whatever that language was the Dr. Turetsky read, we can create that as an exception to you, which you would now say filling a expired prescription. Because that is relevant. Uh, Oh, it's far more relevant than drunk driving for a one of these technicians or for not technicians for one of these SLDs. It's far more relevant. If you are filling un if you are filling expired prescriptions, you are doing misconduct. That's what we're supposed to be focused on. Um, and that clearly states it. But we understand there it, it makes sense that there's a emergency exception. And then that's where this part comes in. And if you fill it and you don't send that notice, you should be sued. That's all. Thank you. I think that was uh, 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 an excellent way to sort of put out the question that we will work with legal on in being sure that this is uh, addressing the conduct that can be held account that a, a, a registered spectacle lens dispenser should be held accounted for. Um, so I think that we'll, you'll, when we come back to committee, you'll see something that, that I think addresses this in that way. We'll continue to work through that with Rebecca. Um, and then I just wanted to say um, that I did begin to, I wanted to, to speak as to the time frame of this. Um, and how we will be incorporating the um, data that's provided to us through the occupational analyses. Um, it is our intention here to make that sort of change a separate item. Um, we are at the 
beginning stages of developing the occupational analysis for unlicensed assistance. Um, in fact, really probably just waiting for us to actually be approved within the budget for that, um, and then creating that with OPES. Um, so we really are uh, at least six to eight months from having that data. And then I think it will take a substantive amount of time for the um, board and our OPS professionals to review that data and figure out its connections. There will be a, a lot of extensive discussion on that. And so again, our intention in making these statute changes, asking the legislature to implement these statute changes in front of you is to create a clear practice act with clear definitions of the uh, with clear definitions and clear provisions that apply to businesses and that apply to individual licensees so that we might have that next step of the conversation from a, a, a very clear, concise practice act that gives us a, an opportunity to move forward from there. Um, so we are, of course, you know, we're awaiting that data. Um, know that the timeline on that is is long, um, and that the discussion around that will be robust. Um, but want to, in this um, request of the legislature, want to remove the definitional issues that have made it difficult for us to follow through with cases with the attorney general. That it's unclear what provisions are part of the registered dispensing optician business and what provisions apply to those who actually provide the services of a spectacle lens and contact lens dispenser. Um, that has been difficult for us in our enforcement um, you know, over the last two years as I've been here and something that um, we know will, clarification will assist us in better educating licensees about the, the laws that govern their practice and um, better able the attorney general to um, assist us in prosecuting cases where uh, 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 an enforcement violation has occurred. So it, it is our intention to, um, of course, review the entirety of the profession when we have all three of those occupational analyses. But our intent here as staff is really to give clarity to licensees so that they're aware what applies to them as individuals as opposed to what applies to them as businesses and to be able to start from a clear practice act when we do undertake that larger work. It's Dave. Uh, Shara or Adam, in the discussions that have gone on regarding regarding um, opticians, filling prescriptions, et cetera, has there been any discussion um, on non-resident spectacle uh, providers, I know they, we have it for contacts, but is there anything for non-resident spectacle providers where folks yes. are just ordering up uh, on a pair of eyeglasses on the internet with or without a prescription? We do have a statute that we went over to review that to expand beyond uh, just contact lens sellers and to encompass all of like optical devices. Great, thanks. So, Madam um, Moderator, are there any more public comments? There were no additional requests. Would you like me to completely close that feature? Uh, yes, please. All right, and I think for the sake of time, Adam, if you would just go on and start talking about the changes to 2559.15 and 2559.2, I think that's the next section we're looking at. Sure thing. So. 2559.15, this was a removing of the term or removing of the phrase allowing for usual and customary absences. So if an RSLD is not sick or late for work, that there's room for them, to, you can operate your business. All optician um, tasks are allowed to happen uh, because of this allowing of usual and customary absences. So we discussed and we felt that the acts of opticianry are, we're trying to regulate them. So then an RSLD must always be present to perform direct supervision. And by having a supervising RSLD always, we're protecting the consumer from eyewear that's improperly fit, fabricated or adjusted. So from our opinion, uh, we would say remove that and that there should always be a supervising RSLD uh, present. And then when it comes to the ratio, the next comment was from Dr. Kawaguchi, the ratio of unregistered assistance to one registered spectacle lens dispenser. Um, 
the DOC, we did have a conversation about it. And um, what it comes down to is you can have a business of 10 to 15 employees and they can help style the customer, do the transactions, all of that. But for me as the only RSLD present, how many people do I feel comfortable doing these regulated acts with me? And uh, Anna and I felt that three would be the max that we would feel comfortable supervising while doing the regulated optician acts. But then it kind of goes back to, you can still have a staff of 10 to 15 individuals. I'm. Uh, Three of them are doing optician duties, but the rest can do any administrative or greeting or answering phones, stuff, um, tasks like that. So that's why uh, our decision was to do three. Um, and then 2559.2a was, let's see, um, so, <laughs> this is a fun, so was that if, uh, an applicant will be required to retake the exam if not engaged in the practice. So how long can an optician go without practicing before you can um, apply for a new license without retaking the ABO exam? Um, and so the addition of has maintained their ABR NCLE or practice within another state allows an SLD, CLD not to take the exam. So based on the comments, because we had comments from uh, both the NAOO and Dr. Kalguchi, so uh, we discussed it and came to the consensus to change to a three-year requirement to align with the ABO and NCLE requirements because the ABO and NCLE expire after three years. Um, and also it allows us to, because um, they have to complete continuing education at the same time within uh, that three years as well. Um, and then also, you know, just as an example, 18 other states require opticians to maintain ABO and NCLE certifications throughout the use of a state issued license. So really in the end, so we decided that three years felt like a good um, time period to say within three years you've practiced and that also aligns with ABO expiration that they would hopefully would still have a current uh, ABO um, certification. So I pointed up I mean, I know we want to have a discussion about this, but since we do have Adam and members of the DOC here, perhaps we could just let them at least talk about the next section, which is 2564.5 and two, the next couple of sections that you guys made changes to so that we can at least get your point of view before our time runs out. Yeah, sure. So we heard um, we heard feedback from the NAOO to, uh, posing the new requirement to have hot and cold running water, uh, and to thinking about the burden on a business of installing uh, like a new system for hot water or cold water, uh, having the term just clean running water uh, as a, rather than hot and cold. We also did in in that discussion confirm the CDC guidelines that, that hot water is not needed, simply clean running water. is So that is consistent with CDC guideline, guidelines for sanitation. And then um, in the next for 256470, so this was the expansion of where right now we have out of state contact lens sellers registration. And based on our discussion with the DOC, we did say that we should expand to all optical devices to be regulated by the state not just contacts, but all optical devices. Um, hopefully all the DOC members are still on the, the uh, meeting because I wanted to make kind of a broad statement. I know that I had a lot of uh, points that I brought up. Um, and one of the things that I feel might have gone on is the intent of the DOC versus the proposed language, I'm not sure that it's matching all the time. So I think one of the things, um, Dr. Wong Chair, that I would suggest is uh, continue to work with staff to make sure that the intent is matching the way it's drafted. Um, because certainly at least one example that I just heard from Adam was the one to three ratio it doesn't read the way that he just explained it. Mm -hmm. And so that might be the disconnect that we're experiencing. Um, 
So anyway, I just wanted to throw that out. That's a great idea. Thanks, Glenn. All right. That was Madam Chair, and I, and I think possibly then I would love to hear, you know, offline if uh, Dr. Kawaguchi wants to send us text that he thinks better describes that one to three ratio, um, that will be helpful as well. Well, I, I think that um, it, I think there was just a miscommunication between DOC and how it was worded. And so it could be that we need to go back um, into minutes and have staff revisit that and potentially partner with uh, our um, attorney to make sure that the verbiage that's used is reflective of what's been intended already because I'm not sure it's matching completely. Excellent, as I said, we would love to, to work with you offline to get text and to maybe clarify that discrepancy so that we're aware of that. All right, so um, it's 11.12 right now. Uh, do we want to continue a little bit more or? And have Adam go over a few more of the changes that they that the DOC is is suggesting. I would suggest no, uh, okay. because I think to that similar issues with a disconnect between intent and current draft. So perhaps DOC goes over the, their changes with staff and legal. And then we look at the new changes for the we um, at the next board meeting, or do we want to have another meeting with DOC with just Ledred? So the next board meeting is I forgot what month it is. Um, is, is in December. Third. I'm sorry. Next board meeting is the 23rd of next month. And we actually have um, been discussing the content for that meeting. There are several um, public hearings that need to occur. Um, we anticipate that the uh, October 23rd meeting will be those public hearings of discipline. Um, so there, it will not be a meeting of, of substantive uh, policy decisions. It will be a meeting on, on discipline in, in open session. So perhaps have DOC and legal look at all their changes, like Len suggested, and do we have time for another ledge reg meeting with DOC as a, like, like we've done today, Shara? Of course, certainly. We can fit that within the, the coming schedule for the uh, new meetings. So let's, why don't we go ahead and do that then? So Adam, if you could find time to maybe come and present to, to Ledge Reg one more time before the next board meeting. I think that would be very helpful. And in the meantime, perhaps DOC and legal and staff can work with what we've already discussed and then just look at all the other changes you guys have under suggestion and um, I think that would be for the best. Sure. All right, thank you. Yeah. Do we want to touch on 2545B1, which is the very first um, statute that I kind of skipped over first because I knew that that would be a larger conversation, or should we put that to a later date? Uh, this, I, maybe we talk about it at the next meeting because I, yeah. I think we're, we're really tight on time right now. Sure thing. Yeah, right. Thank you. All right, so then so the next item that's on the schedule is item five to discuss the optometry board strategic plan. But I think we're gonna have to wait that put that off for the next meeting as well. Correct, Shara? Um, if it's possible, I, our our uh, discussion yesterday during DOC was very limited. 
Um, I don't know if there were particular points that committee or committee members wanted to bring to bear on the strategic plan. Um, I just uh, we are going to packing in quite a few meetings between here and the end of the year. Um, so I just want to make sure that we're able to meet all these timelines. Um, and it is imperative that we have uh, a review of the uh, the strategic plan and a draft plan presented to the board um, at our next uh, available substantive meeting. Okay, so if we could have one more meeting with Ledredge and, and DOC presenting before the next board meeting, that would be great. And then we could also talk about strategic plan at that meeting also. So a, a point, will, a question that I would have for Sharf, we related to staff. I know that there is some, with the pandemic going on, I know there's some shifting of staff responsibilities that are out of our control. Um, will we have the time to do the review as discussed with the OC and staff uh, for uh, new wording to the draft? Um, should we keep the keep it loose? And depending on how that's going, then communicate with our LRC chair to determine when the next meeting would be? That would be my preference. Um, just we we have had a committee meeting and a board meeting every month um, since May uh, and want to be sure that we're able to prepare um, all of the strategic plan documents um, and um, also coming into sunset review is another substantive part of what we've got to get done before the end of this year. Um, and so want to make sure that we have time uh, with our staff resources to do that. So would like to keep it loose as to exactly when the next date of the LRC DOC committee meeting would be to review this. Okay. That sounds good. All right, so then I'm just going to push forward and are there any future agenda items that anyone wants to add to the next meeting? Nope. Then I'm gonna move on to item seven, which is adjournment. Thank you everybody for coming today. And I thank Adam and members of the DOC, especially for coming in and talking us through a lot of the changes. Uh, for uh, agendas, not uh, items not on the agenda, we have to take public comment. Oh, sorry. Madam moderator, could you open it up for public comment for future agenda items? Uh, pardon me. Actually, you're you're fine. You're ready to adjourn. You've already taken public comment for the meeting. Of course, you can take it again. But if if you'd not, I would like to adjourn. You can. This is the moderator, Madam Chair. What would you like me to do? Well, if we are fine with that having public, why don't we just go ahead and open up for public comment? Sorry. This is the moderator, and I have opened the Q and A feature. If you would like to make a public comment, please click on the Q and A icon located at the bottom of your screen. Once you have that icon accessed, please click. I would like to make a public comment. Type that in the ask field and send to all panelists. I will take all comments in the order they are received. Yes. Madam Chair, at this time, we have not received any requests for public comment. Would you like me to close this feature? Yes, please. So this feature has been closed. Perfect. On that note, we're going to move to item seven, which is adjournment. And again, thank you everybody for coming today. And maybe we'll see everyone before our next board meeting in October. Thank you all. We appreciate your time, committee members. Bye. Bye. This is the moderator. I will now close this event.